All right. Hello. I'm sorry, there may have been a little bit of a delay there. Uh, seems there was initially a lag in the streaming software, but looks like we're all set up now. Uh, I will say the technical difficulties have steadily decreased with time as if these, these have gone on, so uh, at least that's something. Uh, well, welcome everyone again to this pop-up session that'll probably be about 30 or 40 minutes long. Uh, I'm partially doing this uh, almost in press conference mode because uh, my, my, my uh, time this afternoon is a little limited, um, and so um, I'm assuming there'll be some questions from journalists, uh, and the goal is that they'll be able to use some of the on-camera uh, uh, and uh, video as well. So I'll be taking questions from everyone, but uh, journalists, please do feel free to uh, add, add questions to the chat, and then I'll, I'll answer as many as I can. A uh, quick overview of, of what has transpired uh, in the last uh, 24 hours, or I guess 48 hours or so, as this cold storm has uh, affected Northern California and brought some significant snowfall to very uh, low elevations. In some cases, uh, it started off uh, along the north coast with sea level snow all the way down to the beaches near Eureka and Arcata with significant accumulations uh, in the redwoods, just a couple hundred feet above sea level uh, up there. Uh, that was, uh, in some cases, a historically significant event. It's been a long time since there's been substantial accumulating snow right at the ocean along the north coast. Um, it does snow there uh, close to the coast, close to sea level almost every year or so, at least a little bit, but often those are flurries or they don't stick a lot. Uh, this was quite a substantial snowfall. That had then uh, extended southward uh, into Mendocino and Lake counties uh, where very heavy snowfall uh, occurred. In fact, above 1,500 or 2,000 feet, there are numerous reports over a foot uh, and a few spots almost approaching two feet of snow accumulation above 2,000 feet uh, in Mendocino and Lake County. That's a very heavy snowfall for quite low elevations for that part of the world. Um, but not to be left out, the snow level uh, in, in Mendocino and, and Lake counties got down to around two or three hundred feet. So essentially all of the populated parts of Mendocino County, uh, except for as far as I'm aware, Fort Bragg right along the immediate coast saw accumulating snowfall. And I'm not sure if there are any parts of Lake County below 200, two or three hundred feet in elevation. So I, I am pretty sure the entire um, all of Lake County experienced accumulating snowfall, and again, some places uh, even around 1,500 feet seeing a foot or more of snow so far, and uh, it is still locally falling in some of these places, so that's a whole lot. Um, San Francisco Bay Area uh, in the North Bay, some rather remarkable snow events uh, occurred, particularly in northern Sonoma and Napa counties where the, the, snow, the snow level, the, the overall average snow level stayed around uh, 9, 9, 900 or about 1,000 feet, but significant accumulations were locally reported to much lower levels, as low as three or 400 feet. In fact, Cloverdale, uh, Highway 101 through the, the valley in, in Sonoma County, uh, and again, Cloverdale is only at about 300 feet in elevation, closed due to numerous spinouts and vehicles getting stuck in the snow. Uh, again, so that occurred within a few hundred feet of sea level on uh, along the Highway 101 corridor uh, in northern Sonoma County. Of course, all of the higher hills and mountains in the North Bay saw accumulating snowfall, more in some places than others, uh, but locally as much, again, especially in parts of the higher parts of Sonoma and Napa counties, over a foot, uh, which remains on the ground now. Many roads are closed. Um, and there is actually a lot of tree and power line damage. So there are widespread power outages. The snow was heavy enough that it brought down tree limbs and even whole trees. So a lot of roads are closed. Um, similar story uh, at higher elevations, slightly higher elevations in much of the rest of the Bay Area. So all of the major Bay Area peaks, the Santa Cruz Mountains, North Bay, East Bay, all saw accumulating snowfall and it continues uh, as, as I speak in some of those locations. Uh, Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, were especially hard hit given that there are actually a fair number of people who live above the 1500 foot mark there and all major roadways have experienced heavy accumulations of snow up in the Santa Cruz Mountains as low as 1000 to 1500 feet but especially 2000 feet and above where 6 to 12 inches once again have fallen 
Uh, so a foot of snow and in some part uh, some parts of the Santa Cruz Mountains, which of course has not melted at this point and continues uh, to gradually accumulate in some places. So lots of road closures up there, a lot more tree damage, power outages once again. Uh, East Bay Hills, the snow got down uh, into the lower foothills. So uh, in Berkeley and Oakland, uh, some parts of the city limits actually saw accumulating snowfall this morning uh, down at around 1,000 or 900 feet. There are folks who live up there and again, major roadways. The snow there wasn't quite as heavy as it was in the Santa Cruz Mountains and in the North Bay Mountains, but it was still significant, historically significant, because we haven't seen accumulating snowfall that low in quite a few years. Um, flurries have occurred to those elevations in recent years, but not actual accumulations on the ground, which was what occurred uh, during this event. Uh, there were some isolated reports of snow flurries to even lower elevations throughout the Bay Area, but those were isolated and don't appear to have resulted in any uh, substantial accumulation. So the snow level did stay, as expected, uh, above sea level in the Bay Area and across most of Northern California, except along the north coast, also as expected. There were some places that saw substantial frozen precipitation, though, even at sea level. There's some circulating images uh, of, of what was either small hail or grapple uh, along the beach in Santa Cruz, and a number of other places saw significant accumulations of small hail last night with thunderstorms that moved through. Central Valley, uh, northern Sacramento Valley so far in particular, uh, another historically significant snowfall event uh, from in the Redding and Red Bluff area, but perhaps even more so because it extended all the way down towards uh, Red Bluff, Cottonwood, and the lower foothills. So accumulating snow down to locally down to two or three hundred feet elevation, heavy snowfall around 500 to 800 feet in elevation. So we're talking like six to ten inches in the northern end of the Sacramento Valley, including major accumulations on Interstate 5 in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, again, uh, largely as expected, but the, this, this was a pretty heavy snowfall. Uh, you know, this is an area that sees snow at two or three hundred feet more frequently than the Bay Area, but not uh, six inch snowfalls. Uh, so this was another major snow event up there. Once again, tree damage, power outages, road closures, all of the above. The central and southern Sierra foothills haven't yet seen a whole lot of snow, although there's been accumulations down to under a thousand feet locally but they're gonna get more snow at low elevations tonight, so uh, the story is yet to be told there, uh, as is the case in much of Southern California, where this storm is actually just beginning to ramp up with heavy precipitation now sagging southward along the central coast, uh, some embedded thunderstorms. Uh, that's gonna continue to intensify across Southern California uh, tonight into tomorrow morning. Uh, there will be heavy rain along much of the coast in Southern California. In fact, there is an elevated flood threat beyond what we had initially uh, anticipated a few days ago in Southern California. Uh, some significant thunderstorm activity. Uh, snow levels started low. Are, they're rising because this storm is actually entraining more moisture um, and is relatively warmer at this moment uh, than uh, it had originally anticipated to be. But of course, the air mass aloft is still quite cold, so there's still going to be some phenomenal multi-foot snow totals in the mountains of Southern California. In fact, it's already piled up two to three feet in some spots. Some spots may yet see another two to three feet of snow on top of that in the mountains uh, over the next uh, 24 hours. And there was some very low snow uh, down to 1,000 or 1,500 feet locally in Southern California yesterday. So most folks in urban Southern California could look up to the hills and see some dusting of white. It generally wasn't very heavy, uh, not nearly as much so as further north in California right now. And this phase of the storm right now is warmer, so I would not expect to see really significant snowfall below about 2,500 or 3,000 feet during the core of the storm. However, on the back end of the storm, this low pressure system is now expected to make it uh, sort of right over Southern California, and so the air loft is still quite cold. On the back end of the storm, there's going to be what's called wraparound moisture, and often on the back end of these cyclones, there is some descending cold air from the upper levels. So I actually would spe expect snow levels from about the Bay Area southward to drop again tonight. Uh, where there could be some additional snow, light this time, snow accumulations at 2,000 feet or even a little bit lower once again overnight tonight. And then uh, in Southern California, that won't, that won't happen so much tonight, but tomorrow 
where heavy snowfall may once again occur in places like the Antelope Valley. So even Palmdale and parts of the high desert could see heavy snow accumulation, not during the peak of the storm right now, which we're most likely going to see rain, but on the back end of the storm, when that cold air wraps back around the low, but there's still precipitation falling, it will likely change back over to snow as low as 2,000 feet, maybe even a little bit lower, around 1,500 feet once again in Southern California. So I know, so I don't think there's going to be any more extremely low elevation snow in Southern California with this event, but there could yet still be significant accumulations down to 2,000 feet, maybe even uh, under 2,000 feet locally, but you'll have to wait until the last third of the storm then. Same thing in the Southern Sierra foothills. Snow may fall as low as 1,000 feet tonight, so that's actually lower and more snow than has occurred so far. Uh, and that may occur mainly on the back side of this low as precipitation uh, comes back uh, westward from the east on the north side of the cyclonic circulation. So this is still shaping up to be a major storm in Southern California with elevated flood risk, maybe even a, a few severe thunderstorms with a, a coastal water spout or, or weak uh, tornadic spin up or two. That's within the realm of possibility along the coast. It's that kind of pattern. Uh, extremely heavy snowfall in the mountains, potentially still something we haven't seen in many years in terms of the total quantity of snow at very high elevations. Still not a weekend to go up uh, into the mountains uh, to try and go skiing or anything. Um, I think at this point, if you haven't left, you couldn't get up there anyway. So I guess that's, uh, that's no, no longer an admonishment that makes much sense. But uh, keep an eye on that if you're in the area. And of course, if you live up there, you're going to have quite a, quite a weekend digging out. Um, all right, I think that's covered most of the event thus far. Um, this pattern will, will, will taper off a little bit uh, uh, later Saturday into Sunday, but then will be replaced by uh, continued unsettled and cold conditions with relatively low snow levels. There's currently nothing on the horizon that suggests uh, there will be um, very low snow to sea level along the north coast or to 500 feet in the North Bay. I don't think that's going to happen anymore with the upcoming storms. The snow levels will probably be above 2,000 feet, maybe even above 2,500 feet, uh, but that's still relatively low. Uh, that still does include the higher peaks uh, in the Bay Area and certainly in far northern California. So uh, folks above 2,000 feet could see uh, continuation of snow uh, into next week. In fact, some of the snow from this event may not melt before uh, there's some additional snow above 2,000 feet during the next event. It's not quite clear exactly how snow levels will go uh, next week, but again, they, they, they're very unlikely to be as low as they were during this historically significant uh, snow event, uh, low, low elevation snow event in Northern California. So lots of really cool photos from folks, uh, lots of folks who've been able to experience snow in places that very rarely receive it. Um, so that, that's been great. There's also quite a bit of disruption and even some damage from the, the trees that have come down and the power lines that are down. So hopefully that, that, that gets resolved relatively quickly. But uh, this has been a notable event and the, the second phase of the storm in Southern California is only just beginning to ramp up now. All right, uh, time to take some questions now. Uh, looking now at what's in the chat. Uh, uh, Craig asks uh, for a comment on the next couple of weeks. Um, right now, it looks like uh, unsettled conditions will continue. There's a lot of disagreement uh, between models. Um, it looks relatively wet. It certainly looks like a cold pattern. There's actually more confidence in that with at least occasional precipitation. Will there be additional significant storms or not uh, is not totally clear at the moment. This is a pattern that is often hard. It's, you know, it, it, can, and it can be pretty persistent, but it can also break down quickly and it's sometimes difficult to, I think, to discern when that's going to happen in this high amplitude flow pattern with upstream blocking uh, a ridge uh, to the west of California that's not, uh, it's blocking the, the, the warm and moist Pacific storm track, but it's allowing cold systems to develop uh, and dive southward just west of the west coast. So it is still an active pattern, but it's one that involves uh, a loopy jet stream. Something that just happened is there was a sudden stratospheric warming event, uh, which again is probably the d d explaining that in full is beyond the scope of today's conversation, but it's something that uh, w well may disrupt uh, the, the jet stream across the northern hemisphere over the, in the coming weeks. The problem is it's never really clear. Uh, the science is ambiguous, and perhaps it really is just rather chaotic uh, inherently uh, as to exactly where that sets up ridges versus troughs. Um, it does tend to stir up the jet stream in the northern hemisphere when we do get these uh, sudden stratospheric warming events. 
uh, that eventually propagate down into the troposphere where we live and where most of the weather we care about exists. Uh, and it stirs things up, but you know, the, the turbulence uh, in a pot of water, uh, sometimes it, it, it really, from event to event, varies where those spin-ups actually result in, in uh, dry and mild conditions under ridges and, and really uh, active and cold conditions under troughs. So it could either prolong the current uh, unsettled and cold pattern or it could result in a sudden shift towards much drier and warmer conditions. So at this point, at least for the next seven to 10 days, it does look like it's gonna to continue to be unsettled and rather cold with low snow levels. So probably no huge flood risk events in the next seven to 10 days, ex with the exception of what's happening in Southern California potentially tonight, which I wouldn't necessarily call it a huge flood risk, but it is you know, maybe a moderate flood risk. There could be some flooding and flash flooding, especially if these thunderstorms develop. Um, so active and cool pattern continues. Uh, the snowpack will likely continue uh, to accumulate, and it's really going to be an enormous snowpack. It already is very large, and it's going to get even somewhat bigger over the next week or so. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll have a, probably have a, a, a check-in regarding the state of the snowpack in a couple weeks as we get closer uh, to mid-March. Let's see here. Uh, how does this pattern correlate? Um, and the atmospheric river uh, in December with the La Nina pattern we're having. Uh, honestly, uh, the atmospheric river pattern in December was a very un-La Nina-like pattern. It was almost the opposite of the canonical La Nina-like pattern. So that was uh, a bit of a surprise. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean that it can't happen during a La Nina year, but it was not the, the, the typical robust Pacific jet stream with a persistent low pressure system in the Gulf of Alaska we would typically expect during La Nina. Uh, the present pattern, although it's active, is, is does look more like a La Nina pattern because there is a ridge of high pressure in the Gulf of Alaska uh, and there is uh, a, a fairly persistent, uh, I should say, ridge in the Gulf of Alaska. It's just that it happens to be far enough west that here in California, uh, that in California we're getting the uh, the the return, I guess you could call it the return flow, the, 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 the equatorward north to south flow on the eastern flank of that ridge. So it's leaving us in the essentially in the cold sector. So all that cold air that's pooling up over the Alaskan Arctic and western Canada can spill southward along the west coast, result in low snow events and cold air outbreaks across the, the, the interior, mountain western U.S., which we've been seeing too. So if it is going to rain and snow during La Nina, this is actually the, the kind of pattern that you would expect to see because it actually caused, uh, somewhat ironically, by a strong ridge. It's just far enough west that we're, uh, we're not right under it. We're sort of on the eastern flank, and that's giving us this cold, unsettled pattern. Uh, Glenn says that there were flakes in western Sebastopol, which uh, doesn't surprise me that much. Uh, I'm sure there were probably some flakes in air, at least in some other places closer to sea level that may have happened in the middle of the night. Perhaps folks didn't see them, or perhaps folks did. I know some folks stayed up, uh, but um, in general, there, there was no accumulating sea level snowfall uh, south of about um, Del Norte County, uh, although it did get down to just a few hundred feet above sea level as far south as uh, Sonoma and Napa counties. Yeah, um, James, the rain is coming. You just gotta wait. It'll be there later today, or maybe into tonight. But it, if you're if you're in Irvine, uh, you'll get you'll get downpours later. Um, the comment immediately below that uh, is from John. Is that uh, is that John's phone just lit up with a flash flood warning here in LA? So clearly, uh, the rain is not far away, um, and that's not too surprising because there is clearly uh, some heavy bands uh, moving in um, off the Pacific maybe some embedded thunderstorms as well. And it sounds like for Santa Barbara as well. Well, yeah, so it sounds like uh, things are really starting to let loose uh, as we have this conversation right now. So um, uh, stay safe out there. I don't think the flooding will be likely be on any widespread basis as significant as what we saw in January. But again, with localized thunderstorms, you know, this is what we saw during the Montecito debris flow. Not that I necessarily think anything on that order is likely with this event, but that was a relatively unremarkable storm, but an exceptional localized downpour right over the Thomas Fire burn scar, and we all know what happened with that devastating event. So all, all, all that is to say, even if the flooding is not that extreme on a widespread basis, it doesn't preclude dangerous flash flooding locally. That's sort of the nature of flash flooding, um, is that it's often uh, localized but can be quite severe. 
can we expect snow levels uh, to to fall around a thousand feet in the barrier over the weekend? Uh, Saturday is predicted to be colder. Uh, I don't think they're going to necessarily get as low as a thousand feet. I guess it's not impossible to get a dusting at a thousand feet locally tonight or into tomorrow morning. Um, maybe uh, later in the weekend if there's an isolated shower. I wouldn't expect to see any significant accumulation at a thousand feet. Although there could be additional accumulations of at of at fifteen hundred or two thousand feet, and maybe some flurries below that. So uh, there are there is a bit of a history of some surprise low elevation snow events during a wraparound moisture events. So essentially as the sky is clear, but as isolated showers develop on the return flow on the north side of a low pressure system. So these would actually be going from east to west. And one of the reasons why that's a sneaky pattern for isolated lower than expected snowfall events is because of course, if it's flowing from east to west over California, you don't have that oceanic influence. So for the main part of the storm, usually the flow is onshore. This is what happened last night. You could even see the snow levels briefly, briefly rise as the precipitation intensity peaked. Um, but with the wraparound flow, even though most of the precipitation is done, lingering precipitation can actually fall at, at lower elevations because uh, you don't have that oceanic influence because the winds are actually blowing from temporarily from east to west and the air aloft is still cold enough to support snow and the freezing levels are low. So I wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't rule it out, although I, I, I would expect it to be a better chance up at 1,500 or 2,000 feet. So again, if you want to see some flurries, uh, once uh, the Skyline Boulevard and you know, in the, in the Santa Cruz Mountains reopens, which I don't believe it's currently passable, um, there could be some additional lighter accumulations that will hopefully be a bit easier to manage. Um, more likely that the road would stay open as it actually occurs in that case. Um, where's the best place to go cross-country skiing in late March in Northern California? That's probably not the, the best question for me. Um, but, um, I mean, there's a lot more downhill skiing, I think, than cross-country, but of course, you know, you don't need huge areas that are, that are flat to, to have some good cross-country terrain. So I defer to others. Maybe other people can share in the comments what their favorite place is. Um, since the, the comments are, are, are a little bit slower than usual today, I've actually been able to, to get through most of them. Um, I just thought I'd reflect, uh, and, f and of course, feel free to add, uh, feel free to add more uh, uh, over the next few minutes. I've got another 10 minutes or so. Uh, one thing that, a uh, question, well, let me rephrase this quickly uh, or, or more succinctly so that the soundbite works better if there is anybody going to clip this for the news later. Uh, one thing I keep hearing is, are questions about the link between uh, global warming and, and this low snowfall event, or the very uh, heavy snowfall accumulations in certain parts of California. And the reality is uh, it, the, the fact that the climate is warmer today, several degrees warmer in California Fahrenheit uh, than it used to be, makes low snow events less likely. Um, that's, that's the long and the short of it. Um, it's interesting to reflect that the uh, the event we just had, had the air mass been two or three degrees Fahrenheit colder, uh, as it might have been uh, 50, 60 years ago, it is very possible that a lot more places in Northern California would have seen snow below 500 feet and maybe even to sea level. So uh, it's interesting to reflect that maybe it's gotten even more difficult to see sea level snow than it was when it was merely a once in a 20 or 30 year event uh, back in the 20th century. Now it's probably something that's even rarer than that, maybe closer to once in a century. So it's getting harder and harder to see sea level snow in places like the Bay Area. Um, you know, back in the 1940s, there, 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 there's records of, of heavy snowfall in the city of LA. And of course, that seems almost unthinkable today, uh, despite some uh, headlines uh, blaring that there's a blizzard warning for LA. That, of course, means the county of LA, which includes mountains above five or 6,000 feet. So, of course, they're not talking about a blizzard um, on Santa Monica Boulevard. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think it is interesting to f reflect on what uh, climate change has done to snow in California. And on average, it has decreased snow. It has, on average, decreased mountain snowpack. It has decreased the likelihood of low snowfall events. It has decreased the frequency of severe Arctic uh, cold outbreaks. Clearly, it has not eliminated any of these things. But what's interesting uh, is that the 
very heavy snowfall events in the mountains at high, higher elevations do not appear to have decreased. In fact, in some places, they may have even increased a little bit as the climate has warmed a few degrees. And I don't think there's any formal research out there looking at that right now, that there could be an increase in the very heaviest snowfall events at high elevations uh, in a warming climate, uh, even as temperatures rise and as average snowfall decreases and as low elevation snowfall decreases rapidly. Um, and that's because, of course, in a warmer atmosphere, the capacity uh, to hold water vapor increases exponentially with that warming. And it's there, there's sort of these two competing effects. One is warming temperatures. Well, obviously, if you've warmed uh, three degrees and you were previously uh, uh, three degrees below freezing and now you're, you're just a, a little bit above freezing, then you're going to sh switch shift over from being primarily snow to primarily rain. So you're going to have a dramatic decrease in snow. But if your average temperature during snowstorms, like at the top of a mountain in California, for example, was, say, uh, five or six degrees below freezing, and you warm three degrees, well, you're still a couple of degrees below freezing. You're still going to see that snow, but now you have a lot more moisture in the air. So uh, you might actually see heavier snowfalls. Uh, that's a, a basic mechanistic hypothesis. I don't have any real numbers on this because, again, I don't think anyone's crunched the numbers yet. Uh, but some interesting things happening with snow, both in Ca High Mountain, California, and really throughout the West, where the mean snowpacks are decreasing, the extreme snowfalls don't appear to be de decreasing, especially at higher altitudes. Um, and then there's, the, there's another question about whether uh, climate change is affecting the propensity of the jet stream to enter these uh, sort of uh, wavy configurations that are conducive to extreme cold outbreaks in, in temperate locations during winter, uh, these Arctic outbreaks. Uh, this, this has sort of been a, a, a real uh, bugaboo over the past decade or so in, in climate science and meteorology. Uh, and the answer is we still really don't know. And I've actually seen a lot of overconfident headlines pointing in both directions. Either this extreme cold event is a signature of climate change, which I don't really think is accurate. Uh, we, we're seeing fewer extreme cold events in a warming climate almost everywhere. But also, you know, the, 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 the fact that the, that the Arctic is warming faster than the mid-latitudes, uh, and the fact that we're, we're losing sea ice and all these things are happening dramatically and the, and the cold, the cold uh, pole up in the Arctic, um, that's not unrelated to what happens uh, with mid-latitude weather. The problem is we just don't understand that relationship very well yet. And so there's a lot of studies out there looking at links, some that find pretty strong links and others that find no connection at all. I tend to believe that there probably is a connection, but that we don't understand it well enough yet, and that it's likely to be seasonally and regionally variable. It's unlikely to result in colder cold events or snowier snow events overall, simply because even the Arctic is warming faster than anywhere else in the whole world. And so that source for cold air just isn't as cold as it used to be. So it stands to reason that the cold air masses that escape the Arctic, even when they do, just aren't going to be as cold as they once were. But then there is a separate question of whether the jet stream is more frequently entering configurations that actually favor the export of that cold air. And that could potentially still be true, even if the air itself isn't as cold as it used to be and could still have significant cold and snow impacts in different places. And there is some evidence for this in places like the central US and in eastern Eurasia. So uh, when it comes to California, honestly, I don't have an answer to that. I don't think it's correct to say that climate change means more extreme cold events and more extreme snow events in California, with the caveat that it might mean more extreme snow events at very high mountain elevations. But everywhere else, it almost certainly means less snow and lower likelihoods of seeing low elevation or certainly sea level snow uh, than used to be the case. So when it does happen, uh, I guess I would say treasure it because it's getting less and less likely at these low elevations. All right, a few more a few more questions and comments. I think uh, Ryan responded uh, to the to the cross country skiing question about Lassen National Park being a, a good option for that. Um, and although I've never been cross country skiing at Lassen, Lassen's a great place in general, so I see no reason to um, uh, to disagree. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you expect heavy rain to continue down to San Diego? Yes, probably. It just might. It's obviously going to take a little longer to get down there, but it will eventually. Um, are the intense weather systems that have impacted the West Coast this winter having a positive impact on the Colorado River watershed? The short answer is yes, although it hasn't been the exact same storms 
that produced all the water in California. So the really big December, January events in California were unremarkable in the Colorado watershed. But then again, the Colorado watershed saw some pretty impressive snow accumulation uh, earlier in the season prior to that, and then again recently. So most of the Colorado watershed, especially the southern reaches of the Colorado River watershed, so the lower Colorado, um, and to a lesser extent, the upper basin, are doing pretty well this year with snowpack. It's, it's, I think it's almost uniformly above average. So that's good news. It'll help out in the short term. Doesn't change the long-term uh, drought situation, uh, uh, but it does improve the short-term drought situation and might might avert some of these short-term, more, more dire predictions for uh, Lake Powell levels, at least this year. We'll see what happens next year and uh, over the next few years to come. Yeah, Isaiah asks whether there's any formal research on the relationship between the jet stream orientation and climate change, and the, it seems that the jet stream location is much more important to California than the temperatures generally. Um, well, they're both important, but for different reasons. Uh, the jet stream, of course, is really important in on the precipitation side of things. Uh, the temperatures are very important on the evaporation side of things, which both matter a lot for drought and wildfire and, and water scarcity and stuff like that. But Ultimately, yes, there is a ton of research on this. It's an almost continual fire hose, actually, that's getting harder and harder to absorb because there's essentially papers published every day or so on this topic. Uh, and there not uh, there really isn't a strong consensus, and this is kind of interesting. Generally speaking, in a warming climate, we expect the jet streams, which of course exist in both hemispheres, the polar jet streams will shift poleward. So that means northward the northern hemisphere and southward the southern hemisphere. But there are major exceptions to this on a regional and seasonal basis. And the North Pacific west of California actually appears to be one of the most prominent exceptions in winter, where the jet stream is not projected to shift significantly northward in winter. So you actually end up getting a mean trough in climate model projections for the future because the jet stream shifts northward everywhere except immediately west of California. We still don't really understand fully why that might be. There is some evidence that it might be related to the uh, occurrence of a more El Nino-like pattern in the eastern tropical Pacific Ocean. Um, that may well be true still, but the problem with that is that in the past couple of decades, we've actually seen a trend in the opposite direction towards more El Nino-like conditions. And so right now there's a debate in the literature, a genuine scientific debate in the literature about whether climate models might not be correct about when this El Nino-like signal might emerge. Uh, perhaps they're missing the, the short-term transient response, uh, which might be different from the long-term equilibrium response. So perhaps we actually might get more La Nina-like events on the path to more El Nino-like events a couple of decades from now. That would be kind of interesting. Uh, or maybe this is just random bad luck and we've just had a string of, you know, there is of course uh, natural variability still that's not caused by humans in the climate system. Maybe we've just had a bad luck string of a lot of La Nina events that have been all essentially coincidental and don't affect this projection of a more El Nino-like state. We don't know which of those two things is true at this point, and it's actually pretty consequential for California. One of the interesting things about the Arctic, though, is to the extent there's been research on how um, melting Arctic sea ice and amplified Arctic warming might affect the jet stream, Several of these studies suggest that it's pretty consequential for California, and then it might actually explain part of why climate models suggest the jet stream doesn't shift northward more west of California uh, in winter. It might be because a melting Arctic actually favors a stormier winter pattern uh, in California, which might contrast with a hotter and drier autumn and spring. So perhaps this is part of the reason why the seasonal sharpness of California's precipitation is projected to increase even further in a warming climate. I'm kind of reading between the lines and speculating here, interpolating between a lot of papers, because there is not a consensus on any of this. In fact, there isn't even really a single paper tying this all together. If anyone out there wants to write it, uh, I'm happy to collaborate, but uh, there's only so many hours in the day. But this is, this is, a, this is germane to a lot of conversations about California's future, climate-wise, the future of California water, and there are a lot of things that we don't understand very well about the jet stream. The interesting thing is that irrespective of what happens to the jet stream, we still expect to see more variability of precipitation in California. This is something that's likely robust whether or not the jet stream shifts in the way uh, currently expected. It's just it's going to modulate the magnitude of that increase in variability. So in other words, increasing hydroclimate whiplash really does appear to be the name of the game in California, meaning that we are going to see a drier dry periods and also wetter wet periods. 
I keep I keep emphasizing that over and over and over again because despite a lot of uncertainty, honestly, regarding the future of California precipitation, I'm pretty confident in that particular aspect of it, that the variability of hydroclimate, uh, the severity of the droughts that do occur, and the severity of the heavy precipitation events and floods that occur at other times will both increase. All right. Well, uh, I think I've pretty much gone through my allotted time. There's a couple of other questions that are a little bit tangential to the topic at hand today, but uh, I hope folks uh, who are ab above 2,000 feet in Northern California uh, get your power back on soon. Don't have too much damage. Get to enjoy the snow a bit. Um, any 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 additional flurries down to 1,500 or 2,000 feet in, in Northern California tonight? Uh, hopefully, folks get to enjoy those. Southern California, stay safe. There's a moderate flood risk, maybe a, an isolated severe thunderstorm risk this evening, uh, and a potentially very disruptive blizzard in the higher elevations in the mountains in Southern California. And then again, th there still will be a low, low elevation snow event in Southern California, again on the back end of this storm, down to 1,500 or 2,000 feet. That includes the Antelope Valley, some of the higher inland valleys, and virtually all of the mountains, even the lower mountains in Southern California. There could be uh, on the back end of this storm, snow following uh, quite a bit of rain. So uh, again, this the snow to low elevations in Southern California at this point, uh, snow levels will drop again tomorrow after rising tonight. Um, all right, I think that's that's all I've got uh, today. So thanks for watching, and uh, see you next time.